this presentation is uh, supposed to be like 40 minutes. I do not have that time, so I'm going to cut through a whole lot of this, so I apologize. The other key point is that this is the first time I've done this in front of an audience that isn't folk at Right Move who are happy to yell at me, so this is going to be fun. So my name's Harry. Uh, I am currently the search tech lead within Right Move. I used to be on the platforms team, which looked after the platform. Um, and over the last sort of year and a half, I worked a lot with consumer different contracts and packs and as we're slowly migrating towards Docker, subsequently Docker. So this is what the talk is about. Who here knows what consumer different contracts are? Okay, cool. Uh, who here knows what Pact is? Cool. So, okay, cool. Good, good, good. Right, so um, really what this talk is all really about is confidence in production. Am I confident in the fact that what I have just rolled out still works with other services in production? Because that's kind of a major thing. Anyway, so. These are the bits I'm going to skip over because I'm assuming you guys all know what a monolith is, right? Good. Uh, you guys all know what microservices are? Good. No history required. Um, wonderful stock photo of people talking. When you've got a whole load of microservices together and they're all conversating, uh, conversating? That's not a word. Uh, <laughs> it's a word now. Uh, when they're all uh, chatting to each other over HTTP or whatever kind of thing you want, uh, there's a whole lot more communication than there used to be between monoliths and now microservices. So, loads more. <laughs> So when you've got all this stuff going on, guess what happens? Not that, slides have moved. <laughs> um, so very quick example. Um, I faffed around with the slides earlier, that's my bad. So very quick example. So you've got your front end for back end, which serves all your web traffic. Hey, look, pretty interface. You've then got your authentication server that's going, OK, is this person authenticated? You've got your invoice service. And then you finally got your email service that looks after all of this. So suddenly you've now got, what, four different avenues of communication between your four microservices. That's a whole lot more than one service that would just call, I don't know, a method or whatever. Cool. Whole lot more. You've then got this very nice example API where you're going email.service.com slash user with a particular ID and it will return you all the messages associated with that user. Brilliant. So you've got all of this. Cool. All kind of roughly makes sense, right? I'm guessing everyone's played with this sort of thing before. So when you've got all this going on and you've got it going across multiple services, guess what? Chaos in shoes. You've got a whole load of things happening. You've got all your services being rolled out. You've got a whole load of different things happening all at once across different teams, across different parts of the planet. Bang. Good times. So this is where consumer different contracts come in. So consumer different contracts, brilliant, nice little definition. Consumer different contracts are a way of a consuming and a providing service to define what they're on about. If you've got a consumer going, OK, look, I from the email service, I really need to be able to go, if I send you an email bit of information, a body, a message, something like that, I expect a 200 back from you, and I expect something roughly on the lines of, yes, your email has been sent. Brilliant. If the email doesn't send, I then expect a 500, or a particular error code that you get back. Cool. This is what this is about. Uh, this is what CDCs are. It is a way of defining that kind of communication between services. So what are the real benefits of having this kind of um, communicate this kind of contract. So there are three key points really, which is enabling microservices to be deployed independently or just services deployed independently. No longer are you, have you got to have all your microservices in one go. You've tested every single version of them in, I don't know, a staging or a QA environment and gone, yep, everything's still talking, cool. I've now got to roll out everything all in one go because if I roll them out independently, I don't know if everything's actually still working. So consumer different contracts sort of solve that for you. Enables teams to work independently from each other. You can have a team in Sydney and one team in London, totally different time schedules. If you've got contracts between your services, you know that, hooray, I don't actually need to spin up that, that service because I know that they can continue to talk to each other. I also can say as a consumer, hey, guys in Sydney, you're going to be my provider. You may not have built this service yet, but here's kind of what I'd like. Super useful for that. Um, one of the main points of consumer different contracts that people don't um, pay attention to is verification of what you're trying to build, which sounds a bit weird coming from a contract from like kind of a, I've got a HTTP request sort of thing. How does it actually really verify what I'm building? Um, a little bit of a background. So I, at home, I like to hack with tech. I just like to break things. I like to build things. So I, a few years ago, I put together a little blogging website um, and I wanted to try out microservices for myself, which proved to me how incredibly difficult microservices are when you don't have an entire team of people looking after logging, uh, network, and all the rest of it. Anyway, so I went ahead and built the API server, which wraps up the database and goes, OK, if I'm looking for a particular article on my blog, I return something. 
great, makes sense to start there. I then went ahead and built the UI. And going, okay, cool, the UI is now going to communicate with the API. Um, and that's where everything fell apart. My provider drove the contract with my consumer. At which point, I went, consumer went, okay, cool, I need this blog. And the format was not correct in any way, shape, and form. It wasn't right. And I realized I'd built the completely wrong thing. It didn't work. If I'd built the UI first, I would have known exactly what I needed from my API layer, at which point my API would have been like, cool, okay, I'm ready for this. Consumer driven, hooray. So what they aren't, uh, this is something I have to drill into developers uh, in different places. Sorry, excuse me. I still got a cold and it's a bit more. Anyway, um, what they aren't, they're, a test, they're not a test of your business logic. That is for a completely different set of tests. These are just purely to define how things communicate with each other. If you are spinning up a database or you're spinning up extra stuff behind the scenes to make these work, not a good thing. Really not a good thing. They're not there for that. Um, they are not an SLA. They do not define how long an application should be up for. They do not define how many requests it should accept. Just purely the contract between the two of them, in what style, and yeah. And they are not a way of validating and verifying external services. You cannot wrap Google Maps in these. You cannot wrap, uh, I don't know, whatever else. You can't do that. It's not possible. Google Maps change when they want to. You can't come up with a way of doing that yourself. Um, so yeah, so this is purely for internal microservices or internal services. You can do these with monoliths. We've done them with monoliths inside Rightmove. It is hard work, but we have done it. Anyway, um, so anyway, quickly back to the API. Um, so yeah, so when it comes to packs, when it, oh, sorry, when it comes to consumer driven contracts, you are defining this stuff here. You are defining, okay, cool. When I send this request, I expect an array. I expect this kind of JSON. And in particular, I expect a to field, I expect a from field, I expect a subject, and I expect a body. If you've got another service that actually doesn't need the body, for example, don't know why an email, but who knows, you don't define the body part because you don't, you don't need it, at which point the provider never needs to provide it, or a different service might never need to worry about it disappearing or coming back. Comes into API migration, which I'm not going to cover in this, but it's super important when you think about consumer driven contracts. Um, the other thing about consumer driven contracts and this, is it should define your errors. So this isn't just your happy path. This isn't just going, okay, if I send this, I expect this. What happens if I send this and that user doesn't exist? In your code for your consumer, you go, okay, well, if I send that and the user doesn't exist, I expect a 404. But if your provider service goes, well, okay, you have defined a user that doesn't exist, I'm gonna send you back an empty array. From the consumer perspective, you've gone, all right, I've got an empty array. The user exists, at which point I now need to go through the normal path of you just don't have any messages. Oh, actually, that user doesn't exist at all and everything explodes somewhere else. You need to define that kind of error codes and you need to define between the two of them, yes, if I don't have a user, I need to return something completely different. Anyway, so moving on to how Rightmove uses CDCs. Um, so there, I kind of built a little checklist of this. Um, when I originally wrote this talk a couple of weeks ago, um, I showed this to people who had no idea what CDCs were, and this didn't really exist, and they had no idea what the hell I was on about. So they then said, actually, putting in a cool checklist, super useful so people can reference it. So I was like, okay, cool, put it together. Anyway, so um, the first things first on the checklist is to define a format to describe the request and response. Kind of useful. Uh, an easy way to create a consumer driven contract, so you like actually generating these things, a way of storing these a way of to test these within our continuous delivery pipeline, a way of enabling us to use rollback, I'll get back to in a second, um, and an easy way to run tests locally. That final one is a pain, an absolute pain, and it matters. As we had earlier on, people were saying that um, it's difficult to run everything locally. When you've got a whole load of services, you've got 20 different services, testing those 20 different ones, do you need an entire set of servers available, or can you run everything on your Mac? It gets a bit hard. So anyway, I'll explain that in a minute. That's kind of more where Docker comes in. This, this does come, eventually come back around to Docker. Anyway. <laughs> um, so, consistent format. These guys, Pack Foundation, awesome people, like the best people. Um, they are kind of Rightmove's sort of sister site. We have no affiliation with them, I should say that. But effectively, these guys came out of realestate.com.au. So, you know, same sort of stuff we do. Um, helping people find houses. Um, 
and they created this wonderful sort of JSON schema-esque sort of thing which defines how interactions work between your services. These are wonderful little JSON files that exist that are generated through, in the case of Java, they're generated using a wonderful library called PackJVM, and you write them like unit tests. So you go, okay, well, if I send this request, I expect this back, and it just generates you JSON files. So um, I'm gonna rewind slightly, uh, so yeah. This is the right moves sort of CI CD pipeline. It is a very simplified, simplified version. It's three boxes and a weird database symbol. Um, so you have a standard commit step where you go ahead and build your artifacts, whatever, blah, blah, blah. You go ahead and upload your artifact, um, and then you go to your, you deploy it to QA and you deploy it to live. I'm assuming you've tested it, so on and so forth. That's kind of it. Um, I should really say something about our artifacts. So we started continuous integration and continuous delivery uh, about three years ago now, I think. Um, at the time, we kind of sort of rolled our own stuff because a lot of it wasn't really mature yet, like Docker wasn't really a thing, um, and so on and so forth. So we went ahead and built, taking the principles, we went ahead and built our kind of own version, um, which effectively we take our fat jar, our Spring Boot application, we grab extra scripts and the start-stop scripts. The start-stop scripts make it agnostic to different places, stick everything in a tar, and that becomes our artifact. And it's immutable, it doesn't change, that's it. So this guy gets moved all over the place, he gets moved to the QA environment, uh, you can bring it down to your dev zone, so on and so forth. That's quite important because that's actually not that easy to play with when you're on your own machine. But yeah, so that's kind of that. So um, how do we fit CDCs into our pipeline? So we have the commit step, and we go ahead and upload the archive for the application. Trick, we actually upload two. So we upload the main one, the one we're actually gonna deploy, and we upload what is known as a stub. The stub literally just takes the controllers and the service layer, fakes the service layer, and just returns dummy data, and has no link to any form of database or anything like that. The stub literally boots and will respond to standardized requests. That's super important because it means that we can now use it for pack testing. Because we no longer need to spin up a database, we can spin up an application that looks roughly like our application, has all the same endpoints, should have fake data associated with it, without having to do everything else with it. So when we get to the CDC step, um, oh, sorry, we also upload our packs, so all those little JSON files we created, we stick them in a thing called the Pack Broker, which is a wonderful little thing that I helped build. Um, well, it was built originally, I then helped change some things to enable it to do some extra bits and pieces we'll get onto in a sec. Um, this stores all of our packs, um, it stores it against the application name and the version of the application we just created. Um, and then when we get to the CDC step, we go ahead and download the stub, we go ahead and download its packs associated with the stub, run the tests, Everything's golden, at which point we deploy to QA and then eventually to live. If everything breaks, this stops here, which means we don't end up taking the artifact out of production, at which point it would then break everything because it can't actually respond to the requests we expected it to respond to. That makes sense. Cool. Um, so how does running the pack tests for a provider? So there's two kind of sides to this, sorry. Ah, so there's two kind of sides to this. So there's the provider side and then there's the consumer side. So I'm going to run through the provider, provider side first. Um, so first off, we download uh, the packs for each of its consumers. So a provider has maybe two or three consuming applications. We download all the packs that are associated with those consumers. We go ahead and download the provider stub. So we've got that little, uh, we've got that little um, Spring Boot application. We go ahead and start it. We run all of the pack files against it. So effectively, we reread it. We send requests to the stub. The stub responds. We validate it. We shut down the provider, and we publish the results, at which point we go, hooray, yes, your application can still respond to requests, or no, your application isn't responding correctly to these kinds of requests. Probably shouldn't roll this out. Um, Here's kind of more of an example that's very right move specific. So we have an application called UK Location. This guy looks after locations in the UK. Um, for example, if, if you throw a postcode at a service, a, serv a postcode means nothing, really. It's just a, it's a four to six digit number uh, with letters that you can, that represents somewhere in the UK. What the UK location does is it goes, okay, why, where is that? And we'll return you a polygon or different formats of data based on that, which can then be used uh, in Elasticsearch or whatever to then find said properties. Um, Property Web is our wonderful front end. So if you go to rightmove.com or .co.uk, sorry, go to .co.uk and you go search for property, you find your list view or you go to maps or whatever, that's that guy. Um, and then we've got property management, which looks after all of our properties. Um, 
In the case of this, so we download the property web and property management packs. We download the stub UK location. We spin up UK location. We use a Gradle runner. So we use Gradle to basically handle all of this stuff for us. It's a really great tool and there's really great libraries around Pact and JVM and Gradle, um, which I'll share links at the end, but yeah, there's a brilliant one for that. Um, and this one can handle sending all the requests, compiling the kind of reports for it, and then, uh, yeah, printing it out for us. Uh, it can then shut down the UK location and publish the results. So the consumer tests are a little bit different. So from a consumer perspective, I want to make sure that my providers are still providing what I expect. A provider could exist out in production for a good maybe three or four months without ever being changed. It may just not be in active development right now. That's fine. Provider isn't going to change its endpoints at any time within that period because it hasn't changed. But as a consuming service, you might go ahead and mess with something without realizing that it's actually being used in such a way. It has happened. I've seen it. Most people will go, that's impossible, but trust me, it does actually happen. Um, so we go ahead and te test to make sure that our consumer and the packs that consumer produces for all of its providers, so a consumer could have maybe six providers, um, all of those packs still work against those. So what we do is we download uh, the particular consumer's pack, go, cool, okay, we've got it. We then go ahead and find all of the providers associated with this consumer, which may be three. Then we go ahead and grab each one of their stubs, we spin them up, we run the pact against them, hooray, it works, shut it down, spin up the next one, hooray, the pact works, shut it down, hooray, the pact, spin it up, hooray, the pact works, shut it down. And then we publish the results of the entire test to make sure that our consumer still works with everything it's going to be consuming in production. Um, example is Property Web. Once again, UK location, but it also consumes some property search. So it goes off to UK location, goes, okay, cool, where's this place? Okay, cool, property search, knows where everything, where all the properties are if I give it a place to search for, returns properties. All right. Um, so it's going to go ahead and download the latest packs of Property Web and UK Location and Property Search. Um, it's going to go ahead and run them, and then it's going to go ahead and shut them down, and then publish the results. I'm skipping through this quite quickly because I'm very conscious of time right now. Um, so back to our checklist, um, we've provided a consistent format, packed. We've got an easy way to create consumer-driven contracts, which are the JUnit tests, which we run whenever we do a build. Um, an easy way to add these tests to our CD, CI CD pipeline, which we've done, and create and store the, uh, and a way of storing these contracts, which is using Pack Broker. I'm actually going to skip over this guy because of the amount of time it takes to kind of talk through rollback. Effectively, it's all about ensuring that if one of our applications was broken in production for some other reason, we could actually go back to a previous version, and even if the previous version had a different API, it would still work. Can't really go into that because there's a lot, there's quite a lot of moving parts, and you're about to see a whole load of slides jump past. Um, and then an easy way to test locally. So um, I'm going to skip over this, sorry, uh, I'm going to skip over that, that one as well, uh, that, and that. Cool, easy way to test locally. <laughs> You saw nothing. Um, so, testing locally. This is where the Docker part comes in. Hey, Docker. Um, let's hope you don't not break something. Um, so, the key thing about Docker is that it's actually much faster to spin up and use than it was to use our TARS. So, we used to download our TARS, unpack them, grab application configuration or whatever, and then we'd run some start scripts that would boot them up. And either way, it would take sort of two minutes to boot up an application. Docker does it much faster than that. Um, it's also brilliant at running different project types. Absolutely excellent at that. So we've got a whole load of Spring Boot applications, but we're also looking at Node. How would it be like spinning up nodes on different environments is actually, well, it's not particularly hard, but when you're trying to do multiple different kinds of things, it means that if, for example, you want to do it all on your MacBook, you'd have to then download Node or N, which is an excellent tool, anyway, um, and you'd have to get Java, and suddenly if you keep growing this, it's going to get worse and worse and worse. Docker sort of solves that problem, um, and it's also platform agnostic, as I was saying, MacBook, or if you want to do it on a Linux server, or a Windows server, or you can actually do it on a Solaris server, I think, if, if you wanted to, anyway. Um, so I'm going to skip over this. No, I'm not. I'm going to talk about this one. <laughs> um, so we go ahead and download uh, the consumer one again, we download the stubs, but this time we're not downloading the tar, we're actually downloading the Docker image. And we're using Docker itself to spin up those images and run the things against it because it's, at that point it's just a standard running web server. Shut it down and jobs are good. A whole lot faster, a whole lot simpler, it means you don't have to install and faff around with tar files. Um, same, apl <laughs> same applies for consumer tests. Um, at this point we're not downloading uh, three provider tars, we're actually just downloading three images, much easier to handle on a command line. Um, 
spinning them up, shutting them down. Great thing is, is that these are also excellently cached because we use version numbers. If you're doing this inside Jenkins, um, you've already got those versions available to you on that machine. That contain those containers already exist. It means you're not spending that time re-downloading something and unpacking it because you can just spin it straight back up again. Awesome. Um, quick note about all of this. So this used to take, um, I've skipped rollback stuff. That adds a whole lot of extra time. But this, all of this stuff used to take maybe uh, eight or nine minutes for a very simple application to do all of this because it has to download, spin it up. It's all sequential. Docker dropped that to about three to two minutes. And we can actually, well, I'm, as I'm going to come on to in a sec, we would like to run Docker in parallel so we could actually download multiple of these images at the same time and test them all at the same time, not doing it in sequence. So uh, are we there yet? Yes, pretty much. Uh, an easy way to run test likely. We've got that. So we've got all of this stuff, which is awesome. Thank you, Docker. Thank you, Pax. All right. Um, the main future is parallel tests, as I said. Um, one of the key cool things about packs and CDCs that a lot of people don't, I don't think have tapped into yet, which is really great insight into the services. These files contain everything that your service is using. It's contain it contains which provider it's using. It's containing which endpoints it's using and how it's using them, what exceptions it expects, and all that sort of stuff. That's awesome. That's way better than someone trying to write it up in Confluence at a different time, or write it up on GitHub or whatever manually. Like, isn't that stuff never going to get maintained? This stuff will, because you actually want to make sure that something is tested safely. If you can tap into these wonderful JSON files, which you can, you can get a whole load of extra information. And I've started doing this. It's taking me a bit of time. Um, but yeah, there's a whole load of great things hidden in there. Um, another point is easier packed version upgrading. Uh, we let our packs, the actual library, uh, get quite old within Rightmove. That was our bad, um, and it's made upgrading quite difficult. I think this is just a general thing that if, if you're using an external library, update often, like, do it. It's useful, otherwise you're listening to them in pain. Um, and I would absolutely love to open source what I've done, um, what we've done at Rightmove, because I think we've got a whole load of really cool stuff that I think a lot of people would really like. Um, it's just making sure that it's actually at a level that people would like. So anyway. That's the future of Rymove and PAX. Um, I'm Harry. Add me on Twitter. Oh, I have to say this because I'm here. We're also hiring. <coughs> Come work for us. A um, whole load of cool links at the bottom. Um, and yeah, that's, that's it. So if uh, anybody wants to ask any questions or anything like that. <laughs>